All right. Hello. I'm so excited to get the opportunity to talk to you all. My name is Jen Wartman Vaughn. I am a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City, and I will be talking to you from my home in Brooklyn. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person speaking to you all today, but I hope to get that opportunity another time. And I can't wait to tell you about my work on intelligibility throughout the machine learning lifecycle. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about my work on intelligibility throughout the machine learning lifecycle. Now, if you're watching this, I probably don't need to waste my time convincing you that machine learning is important. But throughout this talk, I'm going to be um, arguing for the importance of taking a human-centered view of machine learning. Now, before I get there, let me just back up a moment and tell you a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from. So my research training was in two areas, machine learning theory and algorithmic economics. This means that I spent a lot of time over my career designing algorithms and proving formal guarantees, and I still do some of that today. But now I spend most of my time on human-centered approaches to transparency, intelligibility, fairness, and responsible AI more broadly. So how did that happen? Well, I can trace my interest in these topics back to 2016 when I went to DC for one of these panels on AI and society that are happening all the time. One of the panelists made this claim that soon our AI systems will be so good that all of the uncertainty will be taken out of our decision making. Now, to me, this was a horrifying thing to claim. The world is full of uncertainty. All of our AI systems and machine learning models have uncertainty baked into them, whether it's explicit or not. It's just irresponsible to tell people that AI could take this uncertainty away. So I came back to New York fuming and immediately ranted about this to my colleague and good friend, Hannah Wallach. Now, Hannah and I spent the next month or two dissecting this claim and why it bothered us so much. This was around the time that there started to be a lot of talk about democratizing AI, making it easy for lay people to build and deploy their own machine learning systems. It was also around the time that Hillary Clinton's chance of winning the US election was hovering around 80%, and the general public was treating this like a done deal. Watching all of this play out and replaying this panelist's quote over and over in my mind, I became obsessed with this question of how well people really understand the predictions coming out of models. As a machine learning theorist, I was trained to always state my assumptions clearly and explicitly. The stating of assumptions was just really core to what I do. And I was afraid that people may not always understand the implications of assumptions that are going into machine learning models or the uncertainty behind predictions. These worries led me to discover the literature coming out of the machine learning community on intelligible or interpretable machine learning. I'll use these words interchangeably in this talk. And I got really hung up on the fact that people were designing these methods without stopping to define exactly what they mean by interpretability or intelligibility, basically proposing solutions without first defining the problem that they're trying to solve. So I started talking about this with colleagues with backgrounds in psychology and other human-centered fields. So people who know about behavioral experiments and about user studies and so on. And I started running experiments to see how interpretability plays out in practice. I ended up getting really excited about this research area and now it's one of the major themes of my research. So why should we take a human-centered approach to intelligibility? Well, we often think about machine learning and we often teach machine learning as this fully automated process. We take some data, we use it to learn a model, and outcome these automated predictions. But one thing that I've learned over the years is that people are at the heart of the machine learning lifecycle. 
People define the task that machine learning will be used to solve. People decide which data to collect. They decide how to pre-process the data and how to label it. And the data itself is often generated by people, either explicitly, for example, through crowdsourcing, or implicitly, for example, if the data contains images of people or text that people have written. People determine the model to use. So should we use a neural network, a random forest, a linear model, something else? People choose how to train the model, how to test the model, which may require gathering more data from additional people. People make choices about whether, when, and how to deploy the model. And of course, the deployed models end up impacting people's lives, sometimes in high stakes domains like medicine or finance. And finally, feedback from these people is incorporated as the model evolves. So given the central role that people play in the machine learning life cycle, I take the position that building machine learning systems that are reliable, trustworthy, and fair requires that relevant stakeholders have at least a basic understanding of how they work. Now, the approaches to model intelligibility coming out of the machine learning community generally fall into two categories. So the first type of approach is to design or deploy transparent or glass box models that are intuitively simple. So simple here might mean something like a small decision tree or a sparse linear model. Um, just as one example, my colleague Dan Goldstein and his collaborators have some really nice work on simple point systems that a decision maker like a judge can memorize and apply on the fly without even a pencil or paper. They show that in many high stakes domains, um, at least when you have tabular data, these point systems are nearly as accurate as complex models like neural networks. As another example, my colleague Rich Caruana has a body of work on generalized additive models or GAMs that falls into the same category. The reason that GAMs are nice is that predictions have this additive structure, which allows users to um, visualize the impact of a single feature. So you have one function corresponding to each feature, like the one I've shown here, and you can visualize that function. The second common approach is to design simple post hoc explanations for complex models. You may have heard of LIME or SHAP, and I would put these into this category. Now, many of these approaches work by approximating a complex function using a simple local ap approximation like a linear function that can be easily explained. SHAP, which I'll come back to later, builds on ideas from cooperative game theory to assign an importance to each feature, which is intuitively a measure of how much the feature contributes to a particular decision or prediction. But despite all of this really cool research going on, there's still a fair amount of disagreement in the machine learning community about what intelligibility means and how to measure it. Looking at the proposed approaches, it's natural to ask what makes a model or explanation simple? How is simplicity related to intelligibility? Do these models actually help users achieve their goals? There have been a couple of position papers examining this issue. And as Finale Doshi Velez and Bean Kim have pointed out in theirs, the machine learning community often has this, you'll know it when you see it, attitude. The difficulty of quantifying intelligibility is compounded by the fact that there are different types of users or stakeholders. And these users have different needs in different scenarios. So the approach that works best for a CEO making strategic decisions is likely to be different than the approach that works best for a regulator who wants to understand why an individual was denied a loan. And this in turn may be different from the approach that works best for a data scientist trying to debug a model. Additionally, all of the approaches I've mentioned so far have focused on intelligibility of the model itself. But if you think about this picture of the machine learning life cycle that I showed earlier, model intelligibility is just one piece of a bigger picture. 
Depending on who our stakeholders are and what goals they may have, we may want to introduce intelligibility at other stages of the machine learning lifecycle, starting from definition of the problem being solved and data collection all the way through model deployment and feedback. These concerns have prompted me to adopt a human-centered agenda for intelligible machine learning. And I should mention my colleague Hannah Wallach and I have recently written a book chapter on this agenda, which you can find on my website. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Now within the FATE group at Microsoft Research, we've been working on this agenda from several angles. So first, we propose that people stop relying on intuition alone and instead empirically test which factors of a model enable users to better achieve their goals. In a few moments, I'll tell you about some work we have in this space that examines how factors commonly thought to influence the intelligibility of a model impact people's use of the model. A second angle is to consider intelligibility beyond models. So for example, intelligibility of data or objectives or performance metrics. And I'll tell you about some of the work that we have in this space, um, examining how the stated and observed accuracy of a model impacts people's trust. Another example, which I won't have time to go into today, is our work on data sheets for data sets, a project on data documentation for responsible AI. Finally, we propose that people design and evaluate methods for achieving intelligibility in context with relevant stakeholders. Here, I'll tell you more about recent work examining how data scientists perceive and use intelligibility tools. Okay, jumping right into this first point. To question our intuition about intelligibility and empirically test it, my colleagues and I found it helpful to think about intelligibility as a latent property that can be influenced by different manipulable factors, such as the number of features in a model, whether the model is linear, the user interface, and so on. And that impacts different measurable outcomes, such as the user's trust, ability to debug a model, or ability to simulate the model's predictions. Notice that all of these properties um, on the left here are properties of system design, whereas the properties we have on the right are properties of human behavior. Now, taking a cue from psychology, in a project led by Farouk Porsabzi Sangda, we designed randomized human subject experiments to isolate and measure the impact of different system factors on the fundamental properties of human behavior relevant to intelligibility. In our experiments, participants were asked to make predictions about the selling price of different apartments with the help of a model. In addition to a simple baseline in which participants did not have access to any model, we considered four experimental conditions in a two by two design corresponding to the four models you see here. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read everything on the screen, but let me point out the differences between conditions. So the models on top use two features, while the models on the bottom use eight. The models on the left are black box, while on the right you see transparent linear regression models with weights that are visible to the participants. And for these, condition, for these conditions on the right, we explain during a training phase exactly how these models work. Now, crucially, in all of these conditions, participants see the same model out input, so the same apartment features, and the same model output, so the predictions. That is, we specifically chose apartments where the two feature and eight feature models uh, made the same predictions. So the only difference between conditions is what people see in between. This means that if we observe differences in people's behavior between conditions, we can safely attribute these to differences in the model. This is super important to our design. I will go through our um, results and studies in detail, but let me mention just a couple of key results and implications, and I'll point you at our paper if you're interested to learn more. So first, we found that participants who were shown a clear or transparent model with a small number of features were best able to simulate the model's predictions. This is perhaps unsurprising, but reassuring to see in the data. 
However, we found no improvements in the degree to which participants followed the model's behavior on typical examples, when it generally would have been beneficial for them to do so. Additionally, we found that in some cases, too much transparency can actually be harmful. Specifically, transparency reduced people's ability to detect when the model made a sizable mistake and correct for it, seemingly due to information overload. This was really surprising to us. And more generally, these results just emphasize the importance of user testing and experimentation over intuition in the design and evaluation of intelligibility models. Okay, moving on to the second direction, intelligibility beyond the model. Let me briefly mention some work of ours led by Ming Yin, who is now at Purdue, uh, that received a best paper honorable mention at CHI this past year and can be viewed as a study of intelligibility of performance metrics. So in this study, we set out to examine whether a model's stated accuracy on held out data affects people's trust. If so, whether it continues to do so after people have observed the model's accuracy in practice, and finally, how the model's observed accuracy in practice affects people's trust. To do this, we again made use of randomized human subject experiments. We showed subjects information about pairs of people who had been matched through a speed dating event. Subjects were first asked to make their own prediction about whether a speed dating participant wanted to see his or her partner again. They were then shown a prediction from the model, and finally they were given a chance to revise their original prediction based on what they saw from the model. They did this many times, completing 40 such tasks in two phases. So at the beginning of the first phase, we gave them information about the model's accuracy on held out data. Then after the first phase, we gave them feedback on how they themselves and the model had performed so far. At the end, we had them answer a few questions about their use of the model. In each of these experiments, we varied either the stated accuracy or the observed accuracy of the model or both. So these were what we were varying in our randomized conditions. Again, I'll skip right to the high-level results and implications for today and point you at the paper for more detail. So first, we found that the model's stated accuracy on held out data does affect people's trust in the model, and specifically that they're more willing to um, depend on the model when its stated accuracy is higher. Um, we also found that people put substantial weight on their own interactions with the model and the accuracy that they observe. So we saw this happen even though subjects had somewhat limited interaction with the model. That is, they changed their behavior after getting information about how the model performed only on these 20 tasks in phase one. These and the other results that we discuss in more detail in the paper highlight the need for designers of machine learning systems to clearly and responsibly communicate their expectations about model performance. We see that this information shapes the extent to which people trust the model, both before and after they're able to observe and interact with it in practice. And we go into this in much more nuance in the paper. Okay, moving on to the final bullet here. I'll spend the last few minutes talking about some recent research looking at how we can evaluate the intelligibility of existing tools with stakeholders in context. This work was led by an incredible summer intern, Harmon Tower, and received a best paper honorable mention at CHI 2020. In this work, we're zooming in specifically on data scientists building models as our stakeholders of interest. In particular, we're interested in how data scientists perceive and use existing off-the-shelf intelligibility tools, what challenges they face, and what opportunities we have to make these tools better. Before I get into this study, I want to step back and talk about why this type of evaluation is challenging. 
And I want to be super clear here that the reason that this type of evaluation is often missing from machine learning papers is not because machine learning researchers are lazy or just don't care, but because getting this type of evaluation right is really an entire research agenda on its own. Okay, so first, this type of study requires expertise in both machine learning and in HCI or psychology or other human-centered areas. It requires knowledge of both the academic literature, but also day-to-day -day engineering practices of data scientists. It requires both qualitative analysis to understand the nuances of how tools are actually used in context, and a balance of quantitative methods to scale up and yield reliable findings. A study should mimic realistic data analysis settings, but not be too cumbersome. Um, and it requires separating out effects of the model, the intelligibility technique, and the user interface of a specific tool. So to address these challenges, we recruited a diverse team of um, researchers and practitioners um, and so on to work on this project. Um, so machine learning researchers, HDI researchers, and data scientists. Um, and these data scientists have practical experience both building and working with um, intelligibility tools. We also attempted as best as we were able to put the data scientists we studied in a realistic context. And you'll see more of that in a moment. And finally, we used a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods. Specifically, we started with pilot interviews to identify challenges the data scientists face in their day-to-day -day work. We then ran an interview study in which we observed data scientists' ability to use existing interpretability tools when faced with the types of challenges we extracted from the pilot. And finally, we ran a large-scale survey with about 200 data scientists to scale up our results. So for the preliminary interview study, Participants were put into context, in this case, working with real data, a real model, and a real intelligibility tool with the Jupyter Notebook. We wanted to explore the use of both types of tools I mentioned earlier, so um, simple models and post hoc explanations. So we had half of the participants using generalized additive models, or GAMs, and half using SHAP. Participants saw a tutorial on the interpretability tool that was based on existing um, published documentation uh, with a bit more detail added. Um, then they saw a trained model with visualizations from the interpretability tool. And finally, they answered some questions about the model. So each of the tools, GAMS and SHAP, provided three types of explanations. The first is local feature importance. So a description of how important each feature is for the prediction made on an individual data point. The second is global feature importance. So how important is each feature um, across the whole data set? And the third type of visualization zoomed in on the way that a specific feature, age in this case, impacts predictions. The model was trained using a variant of the adult income data set that was modified to reflect the types of challenges um, we extracted during the pilot. So for example, we saw that data scientists often face problems due to the way that missing values are filled in. So before training the model, for 10% of our data points with positive labels, we removed the age value used um, in, and used the common approach of replacing it with the mean age across the data set, which in this case was 38. And this resulted in a model exhibiting a strange jump in predictions uh, for 38-year-olds. Okay, a couple of different themes emerged from our qualitative analysis of the interview data. So first, we found that there are a set of participants who overuse the tools, using them too much um, to justify cases where the model exhibited strange behavior. And this led them to place too much trust in the underlying model. Um, as one participant who has given GAM said, age 38 seems to have the highest positive influence on income based on the plot. Not sure why, but I guess if that's shown, it makes sense. 
Another participant who was given SHAP ran some tests on their own and was willing to accept the model's behavior when those tests agreed with SHAP's output. On the flip side, we also saw some cases in which participants overused or sorry, underused the tools because they weren't confident about exactly what the tool was showing them. Another theme that emerged was the importance of social context. So in particular, participants seemed willing to trust what the intelligibility tools were telling them simply because they were publicly available tools. And as you can see here, one kind of explicitly said this. Now to scale up these results, we ran a large survey mimicking the interview setup as best as we could. We took advantage of having a larger pool of participants to run some randomized controlled experiments. We randomized two things. First, we randomized whether each participant used generalized additive models or SHAP. And second, to understand how people were affected by the content of the explanations themselves, we randomly showed half the participants a manipulated version of the global feature importance values, in which we showed the less important features as more important and vice versa. Our qualitative findings on the whole were similar to what we saw in the interview study, although some additional themes emerged. Um, I'm running low on time, so I'll skip over this. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of our quantitative findings. So first, um, participants had higher accuracy on multiple choice questions about visualizations using GAMS compared with SHAP. Um, participants using GAMS are also more confident compared with those who use SHAP. Um, and we saw that manipulating feature importance values reduced participants' confidence that the explanations were reasonable. So this is, this is, is a good thing, right? Um, they're less confident when we show them the manipulated explanations. But on the other hand, we saw that this did not lead to increased suspicion about the model or the interpretability tool as we would have expected. Okay, so this work suggests several next steps for the research community that I'll just quickly highlight here. First, we need more interaction between machine learning and HCI researchers, and we need it to happen earlier. Second, we need more tools that are encouraged to, that are designed to encourage deep thinking and discourage people from making snap judgments. So as one of our participants really nicely put it, um, there's this concept in UX called thinking fast and slow. And while these visualizations are made to make me think fast, every detail about them requires that I think slow. Finally, in our study, we had only about half an hour of time from each participant. Um, and the community really needs more long-term studies to explore how understanding and usage of these tools changes over time. Okay, popping up a level, I've told you about studies that we ran on lay people and data scientists, but there are many other stakeholders who might require intelligibility. And a huge wide open direction for future work is to better understand the needs of these stakeholders and how to design approaches to help them. Finally, we just need to take a broader view of intelligibility, as I've argued, and think about how to bring intelligibility to every stage of the machine learning life cycle. All right, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, that's all, thank you.